Right. I'm actually gonna use uh, a PowerPoint to show what I'm talking about, because yeah, we're from the Black R guys, and we have a lot of interesting materials. I thought let me, you know, show some of it. Um, and yeah, let me start out with a, a mini quiz. <laughs> um, just to see what 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 you know, people already know. On top right here, we see a couple named Otto and Hermi or Helmina Haswald. Anybody heard of them before? A show of hands. Yeah, a few. In the middle right here, we have Anton de Com. Anton de Com. Anybody heard of them before? Okay, like five to ten percent. Um, right here, we have Lulu Heldet. Who knows her? Trick question. Only a few know. Um, but uh, it shows that uh, there's a lot of fascinating history uh, in all of these different European countries, histories of black resistance, which, uh, uh, like you said, Beatrice, we don't learn about in school. And only later, when we start to dig into the history, we find out that, uh, like, hey, there is actually a history of resistance right here, and we can claim it. So that's what I'm going to talk about in the Dutch context. And like the Portuguese, they tend to look at themselves as like, uh, you know, the open, non-racist society, uh, especially the Dutch tend to look at themselves as, you know, the country of openness, tolerance, equality, and freedom. Um, that's maybe what you've heard. But they've actually been one of the major colonizers as well. Yeah, the Portuguese were one of the first, and the Dutch were like, hey, let's do that too. So um, in the West, they had several colonies, like Suriname, that's where what my parents are from, the Dutch Caribbean, Curaçao, Aruba, and a few other islands. Uh, they actually colonized New York before the English, but, you know, they did a little trade. And in the East, Indonesia, um, Sri Lanka, uh, let's not forget about the part of Brazil. So they've been around. And there's this interesting book by Gloria Weckert. Some of you may know it. Uh, it's called White Innocence, which touches upon what I've heard in different countries. You know, uh, she, she describes this paradox in which she says that on the one hand, in the Netherlands, and I think a lot of other European countries as well, you, this, you see this very dominant self-image that, you know, we're the open country of tolerance, equality, you know, we are enlightened. Okay, maybe we were involved in slavery, but it's a long time ago. And especially the Dutch are like, hey, you know, we're just a small little country. We got up occupied by the Nazis, so we learned our lesson. We don't do race anymore. However, at the same time, as I just showed, they were a major colonial empire for several centuries. And that, meant, that means that it obviously left some traces behind in present day society. So let's look at that. Um, let me tell a little bit more about us, myself, Black Archives. We started as a student collective, um, partly because of what you said. Eh? We went to school and we didn't let learn anything about colonial history. But we did learn it at home eh? from our families, from uh, going back to where we were from. I was born and bred in Amsterdam. Uh, but I went to Suriname often. So as a student, we set up this collective for black students and uh, yeah, graduates called New Urban Collective to address these issues. And that was in 2011 that we started. A few years later, we were approached by a few guys named Chemo and Miguel Halbron. You can see them on the picture right here. Their father was Waldo Halbron. And he was an anthropologist from Suriname who did a lot of research on colonial history and history of slavery. And one of the things he wrote about, and it's too much text, but I'll just summarize, is basically that often we tend to look at history and it's being presented as if there's one objective, neutral, national history. And like the Portuguese, yeah, we're, uh, yeah, the, the, we were from the age of discovery. And the Dutch used to say, or like to say, you know, we had this great golden age. And they present it as if that's a neutral, objective history. Whilst yeah, you can look at that more critically, and ask the question like, okay, uh, golden age, but for who was it golden? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, for the Dutch who went there and you know started these plantations and made a lot, it was very golden. But if you ask it to the people who were colonized and had to were forced to work on these plantations, they'll probably beg to differ. 
So he was very critical about that, and um, unfortunately, he passed away. And when he passed away, he left behind a huge collection of books, which his sons inherited. And they shared that collection with us. So together with them, we started with a small little library in Amsterdam North. You just put them, bought some cheap shelves at IKEA, put the books in there, and called it our Black History Library. But we had to leave that space because of gentrification. I heard that's a problem in Berlin as well. So, you know, we feel you. Um, and when we were looking for a different space, we ended up in this building in Amsterdam East. And it's a building owned by the oldest association of Surinamese people in uh, the Netherlands. It was set up in 1919. And um, yeah, I had heard about them, but I did not really know it that well. We just had, we needed space, so you know, <laughs> we went there. And this is what the space looked like. As you can see, it was uh, a bit messy. Uh, but we were desperate, so we made a deal, and we said, hey, we can help you clean up if we can put our books there. You know, in reality, I thought we'll just throw everything away and then, you know, we have a lot of space. But whilst cleaning up, uh, we found out that there was a lot of interesting material hidden in those boxes. I'm going to show a few examples in relation to today's theme. Um, and yeah, it's an old building, so no, no elevator. We had to walk all the stairs. But Let's look at a few examples here. Old Ebony magazine, Frederick Douglass on the cover. New York Times magazine from the 1950s. Uh, Time magazine with James Baldwin on the cover. In the middle right here, we see a book of uh, Langston Hughes, a well-known playwright and, and uh, poet from the Harlem Renaissance with his personal notes in it. And so when we saw that, we were like, hey, this is quite some fascinating material, not just some junk laying around. Um, we also found some things from closer to home. Here, a pamphlet about Kitty Koti. Kitty Koti is the annual commemoration of the abolition of slavery in the Dutch West Indies, as they used to call it. And like you said, going to school, we thought most people came in the 70s yeah, as migrants. Suriname became independent in 75, so that's when people started to organize. But when we found this, we were like, hey, wait a minute. So already in the 1950s, apparently people were organizing commemorations and things like that. And also Du Bois, you mentioned him as well. Uh, apparently he visited Amsterdam in the 1950s as well. So it was like we found a hidden history. And these are just a few more examples. This is about housing market discrimination in the 1970s and people fighting against it because yeah, they said, hey, yeah, we, you're welcome, but uh, we don't want too many of you in our own neighborhood. Yeah, we're tolerant, but uh, not too tolerant. Um, so newspaper from the 1970s from the association, because people also fought against that housing discrimination by squatting empty buildings in Amsterdam Southeast, which became one of the most black neighborhoods in Amsterdam. So also found a few pictures. Uh, booklets, uh, this one's about racial profiling and police violence in the 1970s and 80s. And I think this one speaks for itself. So when the Black Lives Matter protests happened, a lot of Dutch people were like, hey, you know, uh, why are you copying those Americans? It's a problem there, it's not such a big issue here. However, when you look at these documents, it shows that it's been a problem for quite a while. Um, pictures of protests, cultural gatherings, uh, Kitty Koti March in 1963. So fascinating history which we found out about only because we ended up at that archive of the association. Um, yesterday we also talked about uh, those intersections with career histories, uh, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, this is an interesting example of a group of black women from Amsterdam who set up a collective called Sister Outsider, inspired by Audre Lorde. And this is them in Berlin, actually, when they were just hanging around with Audre Lorde in the 1980s, which is amazing. Um, this is Gloria Weckert, by the way, who I just mentioned in the introduction. So one story I briefly want to talk about a little bit uh, extra. It's the story of Hermie, of Helmina, and Oslo Haswald. 
Otto was born in Suriname, uh, first generation born after slavery. Hermie was born in British Guyana, 1905. And both of them ended up in New York in the early 20th century, 1910s, 20s. Um, to make a long story short, uh, Otto became the only black co-founder of the Communist Party in the United States in 1919. And here you see him in the picture, 1922, in Moscow, together with Claude McKay, uh, also a well-known Jamaican, uh, American poet and activist. And here you see a whole group of black people, African-American, Langston Hughes, Otto, also somewhere in the Soviet Union in the 1930s. So you can imagine that it was fascinating for us to find out about this, because we had never heard about this, never learned about this in school, but also not in our own community. Yeah? So even amongst a lot of Surinamese people, this is quite unknown. Um, one of the things they did is that they yeah, became part of this communist movement, but tried to um, yeah, put what they called the Negro question on the agenda because yeah, they argued if you truly want a world revolution through true class struggle, then you must also pay attention to uh, the issue of race and colonialism. And to do that, they traveled to a lot of places, uh, the US, Caribbean, uh, Hamburg, Paris, London, uh, and a few other. They also were to South Africa, so I should put a star here as well, in the 1930s. One of the most interesting things we found out about during our research was this debate between Haswout and Marcus Garvey. And it was mentioned yesterday, uh, Garvey, well-known pan-Africanist, black nationalist, to me, a uh, big inspiration. So when we found out about this Surinamese guy who actually went to Jamaica to debate Garvey about the question of how to deal with, um, as they called it, the Negro problem, yeah, so the issue of uh, black emancipation, it was fascinating because it dealt with <clears throat> a lot of things we're still dealing with now. Yeah, the intersection of racism and capitalism is still a problem. And 100 years ago, they were already talking about this. So we didn't find out who won the debate. Some people say Garf, some has odd, but you know, oh, I'll leave it uh, in the middle. The Negro Worker was one of the publications that came out of this block, Black Communist Network. Uh, yesterday, you mentioned Joseph Billet. Um, this was actually first printed from Hamburg and then smuggled to the different colonies and other places. And for a while, Otto Haswat was the editor of this paper. Here you see Joseph Billet. And when I started to Google, I actually found this very interesting article from the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung. Um, so, but what you see is uh, a lot of interesting similarities. In all the stories I heard, uh, you see that there's a long history of black radicalism, which has always been transnational. There have always been these connections uh, before Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and all these things. These people already uh, uh, connected. Another example, Congress of Negro Writers and Artists in the 1950s, where you have people like uh, Fanon, Hughes, Du Bois, Aime Cesaire, and others, also attended by the Haswats in Paris. So we found out about this, and we were like, hey, how can we make this more you know, uh, uh, feasible, and especially also accessible? Because not everybody has the means or the time or the, you know, the energy to delve into all of this literature. So we decided to make an exhibition uh, in the building of the association, and this is what it looked like, the story of Hermie and Otto Haswald, two black revolutionaries. And yeah, Angela Davis visited us, which was also pretty nice. So what we also try to do, and my partner Jessica is here as well, is look at you know these silences in history, because black history is already silence, but when we look at women's history, it's also silence. When we look at black women, it's like a double silence. So we try to look at that as well, because in these histories, you often see that black women were very active, but yeah, not in the more visible leadership positions. So we often work with visual artists. This is a work by an artist named Elis Kensmill. And she made this work about different black women who've been active in different times, like Herbie Haswald, but uh, Amy Ashwood Garvey was mentioned yesterday. 
Claudia Jones was mentioned as well, was also part of the black communist movement and looked at you know, the, the position of women uh, writing about tribal oppression. So there's a very long history of black radicalism. Oh, five minutes, oh my God. All right, I'm gonna speed it up. I'll talk very briefly about Anton Nkoma, another interesting example. Born in 1898 in Suriname, just like Haswat. Uh, but he didn't go to New York, he went to the Netherlands to you know, find a job and uh, other opportunities. And in Amsterdam, he gets in touch with Indonesian nationalists and communists, which inspire him to be, think more critically. So he goes back to Suriname, eh, because slavery was abolished, but obviously colonialism was still a problem, because eh, they brought people from India and Indonesia to take over the work on the plantations, uh, and they were exploited as well. So, he decided to set up an advisory company on the yard of his mother, because officially it was prohibited to organize political meetings, and became so popular that hundreds and hundreds of people came there every day. And because of that, he was seen as a threat to the colonial order. So they deported him to the Netherlands in the 30s. And that's when he wrote his book, We Slaves of Suriname, which became the first publication from a Surinamese anti-colonial perspective, 1934. Um, and what makes his story extra interesting is that he, uh, when the Dutch were occupied by the Nazis, he joined the resistance and unfortunately got caught and passed away in the concentration camp Neuengamme here in Germany. So for a long time he was, yeah, his book was very hard, hardly to get. Um, and in Suriname circles, he was you know, known as a hero, but in the Netherlands, almost nobody knows, knew this story. And what we found out about in the archive was that in the 80s, there were Surinamese uh, uh, action groups who set up a petition to honor Anton de Kom. They even set up a petition, went to the Dutch parliament, but never got a reaction. And the interesting thing is that only after the Black Lives Matter protests in 2020, the Dutch parliament reacted. And now he became part of the curriculum. And uh, well, there's a statue of him in Amsterdam Southeast. Um, and his book became a bestseller 80 years later, which is uh, pretty nice. So last minutes, I'll talk about the present day. Um, over the past 10 years, there have been a lot of interesting developments in the Netherlands. Uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, this hideous, Dutch tradition. Uh, it's the most popular tradition, a bit like Christmas, but instead of elves, they come with black beats. Uh, black beats are yeah, caricatures of black people. Uh, as you can see, often played by white people in blackface, and it's all over the news, in TV, schools, everywhere. And uh, black people have been protesting against it for a long time, but it never really got a lot of you know, traction and attention until 2011. When a few guys or a few people set up a campaign called Black Peter's Racism, Swata Peter's Racism. By the way, what Dutch people say is that Black Peter's black because he, he comes through the chimney and magically becomes black, but his clothes are very nice. Okay. Doesn't make sense at all. Colonial logic. But uh, yeah, so 2011, these guys set up a campaign and they went to one of the parades, because, you know, it's a country of openness, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, so, you know, they wanted to use their rights by just going there, standing there with a t-shirt. But as you can see, they got arrested violently by the police. Uh, and that video went viral on social media and it sparked a huge debate and actually a new movement. Um, so, it's a few years later, 2013 uh, was the biggest protest, as far as I know, uh, of and against anti-black racism in Amsterdam. We had uh, like 800 people, and for us it was amazing because it was the first time that black people came together, not just for, you know, uh, something else. And from that, a new movement arose. Uh, we became involved in that as well, a group called Kick Out Swat Pete, in which we tried to, you know, address this issue by, through non-violent protests at these black Pete. Uh, 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 parades. And again, we thought country freedom of speech, but no, a lot of violence from police, mass arrests, 
Um, nou ja, uh, this time, like 60 people got arrested. I have to give a shout out to the ISD, because even members of ISD were arrested uh, 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 at that first protest. And it was a very interesting period, because we also became part of MPED, European Network of People of African Descent, unfortunately not active anymore. But it did show that you know, there's a lot of potential in black European solidarity. So over those years, we start, organized all kinds of protests in different, country, uh, different cities. Uh, we didn't just face police violence, but also violence from you know, like radicalized white people. Uh, extreme right people, for example. You know, this was my car. We had a meeting and was ambushed by, by extreme right people. They didn't get in the building, but they did abol uh, demolish a lot of stuff, including my car. I did get a new car, by the way, you know. That's a side note. Um, so for us, it was very fascinating that there was a whole decade of a lot of protests, but this was November 2019. There were like 800 or 900 people after that fascist attack. And that was for us like a record, like, whoa, 900 people, that's amazing. And then a few months later, yeah, we have the pandemic, uh, George Floyd is murdered, worldwide you saw the protests, and in Amsterdam, like 15,000 people. That was crazy. And we had very mixed feelings, as you can imagine, because all those years before that, you know, we were fighting Dutch racism but when something happened in the United States, all of a sudden, white people became aware that, you know, race is an issue and we should, they should do something. Not just white people, actually, a lot of black people as well. Um, but it did, you know, create potential to grow the movement. So we organized protests in almost every province of the Netherlands. And, uh, yeah. We developed a manifesto called the Black Manifesto with our political demands. And because uh, all of a sudden the prime minister and the mayors, everybody wanted to talk to us whilst six months before that, they didn't even respond to us. Um, and in that we also looked at black communities in an intersectional way. So yeah, ethnicity, sexuality, health, gender, religion, all those things. Because uh, you know, also black communities are not homogeneous, but yeah, very diverse. Um, so what we try to do, and I'll wrap it up because I know I don't have that much time. We try to do different things on the one hand through political, uh, 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 you know, lobbying with the manifesto, but also through the arts yeah, because we think art can be a very interesting way of reaching out to people, making information accessible. So we made an exhibition called Facing Blackness, in which we also show the even older history of black presence, uh, already in the 16th and 17th century. There were black communities in Amsterdam and the Netherlands, and uh, these are paintings uh, which, uh, which can be seen about that. Uh, uh, there were a few black people who often went to universities, like Jacobus Kaptein and Anton Willem Amo here in Germany. Um, uh, we have a talk about black presence. We also have to look at scientific racism and how that influenced black, the imagery about black people. Yeah, so when you look at Black Pete, we look at it, it in the context of this long history of racist imagery uh, in Europe. And it's also one of the many examples of these kinds of traditions. Yeah, everywhere you have all kinds of blackface traditions with different historical contexts, obviously. So, lastly, what are some of the interesting achievements? Uh, this is Silvana. She's, as far as I know, the first black female in Europe to set up her own party and got elected um, in the Dutch parliament last year uh, with a party called Bay Ain, based on intersectional perspectives. They also got some seats in the local elections, I believe, this earlier this year. Uh, we set up a petition to make Kitty Koti July 1st a national free day. Got more than 60,000 60, signatures, um, but unfortunately, the politicians did not do anything with it yet. Um, another major interesting development is that the city of Amsterdam, Rotterdam, and Utrecht formally apologized for their role in slavery uh, last year. Uh, and now our demand is that the nation also, you know, apologizes and then we can talk about reparations, but they're not ready for that. Um, and this is something that happened recently. 
uh, two weeks ago, and there's a huge scandal of the Dutch tech services who, yeah, uh, 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 developed some racist policies, and they actually admitted it. And that is something that's quite rare in the country of white innocence. So, um, let's see, no, I don't have it here. But currently we're working on an exhibition in Kassel as part of Documenta. And what we will do there actually is show these histories of black international solidarity um, to yeah, also show the connections with different countries and, and, and people. So I'll uh, wrap it up with that. Thank you.